common mistakes. I said a while ago that ground snow is not the same as roof snow. And that's one of the big mistakes that's frequently made, is that whatever the ground snow is, that's what the roof snow is. Now, under normal circumstances, that will actually give you a conservative answer. If you use ground snow for roof snow, most codes, all codes, uh, allow you to reduce the ground snow when, when you're using roof snow. Um, and, and the reason is ground snow is as much snow as is recor in recorded history within a 50-year period of time. That's the most snow in terms of pounds per square foot that ever accumulates on the ground in, in a, pardon me, in a 50-year mean reoccurrence, okay? And when engineers move ground snow to roof snow, they're allowed by, by all model codes to reduce it by 30%. There's some buts that, that I'll get to. So in, in, in normal situations, just a plain gable roof, you can reduce ground snow when you put it on the roof by 30%. So if you use ground snow as roof design snow, you're, you're going to wind up with a conservative answer on all the math we just did. But there are exceptions to that. Here we see what. A technical term is aerodynamic shade. In this area here where we have high adjacent walls, when engineers calculate design roof snow for an area like that, it's quite complex, those calculations. But it could be two, three, four, even five times what the ground snow is. OK, so you really need to know, especially when you have a situation like this, you need to know what that design roof snow load is in order to do the calculations that, that we just performed. Simple gabled roof, you can use ground snow. You're going to get a conservative answer. Here's another one that happens often, miscalculating tributary loads. But we have a, seen this a lot. Well, we don't want to protect the whole building, Eve. We, we just have one door there. We want to protect that door. OK. So we only want to use you know eight feet, stick a color guard up there. And so the tributary load looks like that. And we do the engineering just like you say, and there we are. We're good. What is the tributary load? to this short section of snow guard. Right? And so this, this happens sometimes, you know, that people, well, we only wanted to hold that little strip. I didn't care what you wanted to hold. What you're really holding looks like that. And, and that, the exact angles and area is a little iffy here, you know, because it really depends on the sheer strength of the snowbank and all those kind of things. And here's the result. <laughs> These are color guard tracks <laughs> where, where somebody did that. And you can see what happened. They had one stick on there. And, and, and the ends from, you know, here and here, because they were subject to so much of this load, you know, you can see that they, they really, and, and eventually the whole thing went. Other mistakes, aesthetic issues. Plastic snow guards, they're practically invisible, right? <laughs> as long as you use them over here in indirect lighting, notice these are barely visible. Um, but don't put them outside in the sunshine, that's all. Clear plastic. Is that clear? Look like polka dots. Here you're comparing pre-finished color strip and, and color guard on the left and clear plastic on the right. Uh, these are the lies that, that you'll be told. It was clear. You don't see it. You'll be the judge. Do you see it? It's pretty conspicuous. 
Uh, fastener damage. The, there are some S5 kind of copycats that have come out with set screw products that attach with cup point screws. Um, we've never used a cup point screw, never would. Some of the very earliest decisions I made with S5 was use a cup point screw, it digs in, it's going to break the metallic coating. That's the corrosion protection. Here you can see what it does. There's actually, there's actually a company out there who is standing there pounding his fists. This is the right thing to do <laughs> using these cup point screws. That's, that's what happens. This is about seven years exposure of a, of a cup point screw. And you can see the corrosion that it's caused. So round point set screw. Performance issues. Um, there are some good reasons that plastic, uh, or not just, pl I'm not just picking on plastic. Any adhered device is bad technology. That's why it's always a good idea to use gutters because then, you know, you can collect them in the gutters and, and, and glue them back on next year. Otherwise, you got to break them out of the yard, you know. Uh, there are actually some scientific reasons that they don't work. Um, all these adhesives are sensitive to hot and cold cycling, ultraviolet light, moisture, and ozone. <coughs> and age and time as a result of degradation from all those factors. So where's a good place to use an adhesive where it's not subject to any of this? Let's put it on a roof. That's a bright idea. <laughs> that's, why they, that's why they fail. And, and if one or two companies wasn't bad enough, you know, s selling these kind of parts. What I'm, I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of guys out there with say this is... Well, that's advantage. incredible holding strength there, isn't it? Wow, that's a strong part. I'm not picking on plastic. Metal's just, it's the adhesive is the problem. I, you know, plastic has some other problems that yellows, it brittles, and things like that. But there's some, uh, there's other, there are other technical reasons why it doesn't work. Um, here you see a molecule of uh, kynar, polyvanillidine fluoride chemical name. You start with a polyethylene molecule, you fluorinate one of the hydrogen atoms, and you have TEDLAR, polyvinyl fluoride. You fluorinate two, you have polyvinyl fluoride, which is trade name Kynar or Hylar. If you, if, you, if you fluorinate all four, you have polyfluorotetroethylene. Are you impressed? It took me a long time to learn how to say that one. <laughs> That's trade name Teflon. So these are all kind of non-stick surfaces. So I got an idea. Let's glue something on it. <laughs> if we're, the, you know, a lot of these guys that sell these glued on devices are going to tell you, oh, you got to prep the panel. You know, you want to take your alcohol and rub it down real good. Maybe take a little emery paper and rub it. <laughs> what they're trying to do is they're trying to get something to stick to a non-stick surface. Let's suppose that we're successful in doing that. We get it to stick on there, and we get it to stick really, really good. So the bond isn't going to fail. Of course, it will always fail in time because that bond degrades with all those things. But let's stick it on there really good so... It doesn't fail. What now is determining the holding strength, the failure point of that bond? What's it stuck to? Paint. 
and there is no way to quantify the holding strength of the paint film. So how strong is it? I don't know. <laughs> and some other bad corrosive things can happen too when, when, when the paint, you, you, because we're, we're using a chemical, the, the, the adhesive is, is a chemical compound and it can have some adverse effects also on, on, the, on the paint and some corrosive effects. Um, performance issues. Here we see the yellowing we were talking about. This was about four years of exposure. So the best practice is to use snow guards attached using mechanical bonds rather than chemical. And when using mechanical attachment methods, it's important that they're not invasive to the roof. And that doesn't just mean not putting a hole in it. It means not using a sharp point, not using a cup point, not using something that's going to damage the galvalum coating. Don't penetrate the roof panels, cause corrosive effects, violate thermal movement. And ideally, that device should last as long as the roof itself. Cost issues. At first glance, it looks like these are bargain prices. Until we do the holding strength evaluation, and then we find out that this part has a 200 pound ultimate load a 40 pound allowable load because the factor of safety is five. Why? Because it's, a, it's an unreliable bond. So we use a higher factor of safety. And that's why it's always important, you know, to do the math that I explained and, and compare. Here's one such example. This glued on part sells for three bucks. There's eight per panel. That's $24 per panel. We're looking at the upper left screen there. And the holding strength at 40 pounds allowable, so we have 320 pounds per panel of allowable holding strength. This one over here, which many of you recognize as S5 color guard, costs about $6.89. This is material only in both cases, not installation labor not included um, per panel and provides holding strength of 526 pounds. So notice, first of all, that this is, is about a, a third or more stronger, but look at the price. So the cost, $24 versus $689. The 689, the color guard option, is, is less than a third the cost of this stuff. The holding strength is 164% of the, so it's 64% greater. And the service life of that is three to eight years. I've never seen a plastic glued on part that lasted longer than eight years. Just never seen it. I mean, I don't know, maybe your experience is different, but. Here's another competitive part. Now, in this case, they're both mechanically attached. Brand A, that's this one. This was taken from an actual job. Ultimate strength on the panel seam there was 490 pounds per linear foot of assembly. And the color guard system was $9.17 for an ultimate strength of 1,849 pounds per linear foot. So brand B in this case is four times the strength and half the price. This was a job in Idaho. You can see the litter all over this roof. Some of those plastic parts that had failed. This was a school, and it was the third time that these parts had failed. And they said, we've had enough. But just for grins, we took the criteria for this job, and we did a cost comparison. Because people say, well, that's the cheap plastic stuff. It's not cheap. So here's the criteria for the job. We went to their own, this is Snow Jacks Ice Jacks. 
We went to their own calculator on their own website, plugged in the criteria for the job, cranked out some prices, and what they said, well, of course it failed. You didn't use enough. We need 12 rows. 12 rows with two snow guards in each row per panel. 24 parts per panel on this job. The, the resulting price per linear foot of protected eave was 50 bucks. The total cost for the job about eight grand. That included the glue and so on. How many rows? 12 rows with two parts per panel in each row. Now we'll look at an S5 calculation on the same job. Two rows of assembly with a clamp on every seam. One, two. Done. Thank you very much. Cost. Remember what the other one was? 50 bucks? This one's 15. Now we're not even talking labor here. This is just to buy the stuff. Think of the labor of putting 24 of those gizmos. So do the math and then make the buying decision. In most cases, you can buy the best for a fraction of the price that you're paying for the junk. This is just another mistake that's often made are homemade parts that penetrate through the roof that are impossible to waterproof like this. And I've actually seen architects do this kind of stuff. OK, there's your takeaways. Use mechanically attached, not adhered. If you didn't get that point, you ain't been listening. <laughs> Snow retention must be engineered. Do the math. There are, there are calculable loads you're trying to resist. And, and, and products won't fail if you do that math. And snow retention must be tested, and it's got to be a valid kind of a test, OK? The, one of the biggest manufacturers of snow guards out there drove his truck over a plastic snow guard. Said, See how strong? We drove the truck over it, and it didn't break. Is that an appropriate <laughs> test 